So, Father Michael uh, Kelly, I would like to know a little bit about your journey into the Society of Jesus. What is it that attracted you to the Society of Jesus? Oh, I joined the Society many years ago, 1946. But I had made up my mind to join the Society about 1943 or 44, quite a long time. 1943 was the year I got that pioneer pin and I'm wearing it ever since then, 76 years ago. What stimulated me, contact with young Jesuits. In my home town in Ireland, we were about four miles from the Jesuit philosophers, and we met them in unusual circumstances in a very severe winter, out skating on a lake, a lake that got frozen, and I met some of them there, I got into contact with one of them, Father Harry Lawler, and we had a good deal of contact subsequently, and I said, his way of life, that's the way I want to be. And so I kept that up. Now, I wanted to be a Jesuit long before my brother Bob ever thought about it. He had almost finished his school when he first made a contact with Jesuits, and on his very first contact too, he said he wanted to be a Jesuit. But I was already committed that way. And I was very happy that he went because it meant that I saw the way of life in the novitiate and what it was like that I would be going into. And as a young boy of 15 or 16, that made me very happy. The prayer that you made in the novitiate, take Lord and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding and my entire will. How has this panned out uh, for your life at the moment? Looking back, I would say the general memory is of peace, gratitude, happiness the whole time, all the way through the society from the very moment I entered. I was always happy in the novitiate. There was nothing gave me great problems there. I, I, I suppose by disposition, by nature, I'm a sort of a, an accepting kind of a person, and I accept things as they come, so I accepted the life there. When I went on then to university studies, um, I was good at those, and I got many affirmations. Uh, and all the affirmation is a great help to people to tell them you're doing good. And I got those in my university studies, success in them, very good success. Uh, while mathematics was my main area, I was actually awarded a prize for the best student in English in the whole university. <laughs> and that kind of thing. But that was external, internal. Uh, I didn't clash with any superiors that I can remember. I got on well with the brethren. And then one thing, and it comes right up to the apostolic preferences in the society today, I was always keen on gardening, on flowers, on nature. And I think I, if I had inhibitions or things to work out of me, I could dig them into the soil and get rid of them that way. But seeing things grow and helping things to grow, this gave me great joy and happiness. I always felt in that I was cooperating with God in making this a more beautiful world. And I'm so happy to see it in the apostolic preferences, caring for the earth, caring for our mother earth, and making it able to sustain us and to sustain the future generations. How can um, you share with us how the Ignatian spirituality has shaped your life in all the works that you have done? Oh, I would say the thing that stands out for me most is the personal love of Jesus Christ, coming to know him and to love him and to imitate him. That's 
we are Jesuits, Jesu Ita, as Jesus. And I think that's the most characteristic thing. And the emphasis on that in the exercises, the second and third week and fourth weeks of the exercises, that was absolutely fundamental for me, and it continues to be fundamental. In my homilies, I suppose the people get tired of hearing me coming back to the same ideas, the same issues, because to me, these are our lifeblood. And then coming out of that, and parallel with it or related to it, that whole idea, God in all things, the presence of God everywhere in everything, so that nothing is rejected because everything is coming from God, whether it is, as we would say humanly, whether it is good or whether it is bad or difficult, a challenge or an opportunity, all is coming from the gracious hand of God Almighty, God our loving Father, and finding God in all things, a great society dictum, that that is essential for us. And I think that that spoke to me throughout my life. How did you find your way to Zambia? Uh, what is it that inspired you to come and work in Zambia? Well, I knew a bit about Zambia when I was a young Jesuit because my brother Bob, Father Bob Kelly, he had come here four years earlier. And hearing from him when he was out here, the letters he used right, there was no email at those days, and then talking with him when he came back, all of that directed my mind towards the work here. I felt that I had fairly, no, quite good, I have to be grateful to God for what he's given to me, quite good intellectual accomplishments already by that time, and that I could put these at the service of the people of Zambia. It was Northern Rhodesia at that time, 1955, and there was no question of independence at that time. It was too early for that. Uh, but that I could put the, my qualifications and my activities at the service of the people and do something on their behalf, help them to come as far forward in the world as I had been helped to come forward by the people in Ireland. How can um, you share with us how the Ignatian spirituality has shaped your life in all the works that you have done? Well, I'd say the thing in the Ignatian spirituality that kind of stands out for me is ad maiorum dei gloriam, to the greater glory of God, greater, more. And so we look for more. More holiness, and therefore more prayer. More happiness, dealing with others. More inclusive, bringing all others in, that we are together and we are united in this great world that God has given to us and that we're trying to prepare ourselves for the experienced presence of God with us. But that can only be after we have left this world, but we're preparing ourselves for leaving it. So it's the more aspect of it that I think was fundamental for me and remains fundamental. And that more is not just more in relation to myself personally, it's more Jesuits, to see more Jesuits in the world doing this work of God, to see more smiles on people's faces, that they are happy in this world, and therefore they're happy with themselves, they're happy with others, they're happy with God. All of it, it runs in and out of every dimension of life and of dealing with people. If you could just trace for us your journey as a Jesuit in this province, what you have done. Um, I know that uh, you started with Chikuni. So can you tell us more about uh, the works that you have done in the society? Well, my apostolate, as you have said, was principally in Chikuni, where I was in the school mostly, 
And I think some of my colleagues who were in the parishes would criticize me that I was too much focused on the school. But I was totally wrapped up in the work there in the school with the schoolboys. Remember, in the mid-50s, there were very few secondary schools for boys in Zambia. And even in the 60s, these were few and far between still. So here I was with these young men, the future of the country, how to develop them, or not so much for me to develop them, but what I, could I give them so that they could develop themselves into be people at the service of others, at the service of their country, which was going to become free. So I spent altogether 10 years, I think it was, 11 years at Chikuni, three as a scholastic and seven or eight as a priest afterwards. The spiritual ministries were also important. There, every day there was mass with the boys, but there was also at the weekends, even though I was involved in the school, going out into the villages, and that meant knowing the language. And I was fairly good at Chitonga. My brother Bob was much better than I was, but I was reasonably good at it. And one of my big regrets in life, in my, uh, my later life, is that I let that slip and that I didn't develop another language when I came here to Lusaka, but things were against it. That was Chikuni. I was heartbroken leaving Chikuni in the early 70s, but I was because of my intellectual abilities and that, and because the University of Zambia had just started, the society wanted somebody to go in there in a teaching capacity, in an academic capacity. So I was sent for higher studies and spent a couple of years in England uh, preparing myself for entry into the University of Zambia. I joined the university in 1975. Now I should say, that back in the 60s, not very long after independence, I became a Zambian citizen. I felt that if I was here working with the people, and this is possible, I should become a Zambian citizen. And I did. And I'm very, very happy that I did so, and that I am now a Zambian, and have been a Zambian since the mid-60s. But when I went into the university, uh, because of a good academic background and that, I, was, I quickly became the dean of a school. And to my surprise, the newspapers took account of this and they headed, Unza appoints the first Zambian dean of a school. I was very proud of that. I was delighted about that that at last we Zambians were coming forward, others followed suit. I remained as dean of the school and then I became, through election by my colleagues, which to me again was a great affirmation, helps to smile on the face. I was elected by my colleagues to be the pro-vice chancellor and then shortly afterwards when the administration structures were changed by a university act, I was made by the president, the deputy vice chancellor of the university, and I remained that for a number of years, and saw the university expand. Um, brought in, um, I was the in-between person all the time, bringing in the School of Veterinary Medicine into the university, and so I was one of the hosts of the present emperor of Japan when he was here and with uh, and his wife. Uh, the Empress. I stayed in the university then teaching, researching, writing. Uh, students like my lectures, I'm happy to say. One of the um, indications of how satisfied they were with my lectures was in the later years when I got tied up with the HIV work internationally and had to leave the country very often. In order to cover the ground, I would have lectures at six hours in the morning. The students turned up with nobody missing. Not only that, but they brought their colleagues along also. 
and they said, these lectures are good, it's worth hearing them. And that was, again, so good to hear that, that the word was going across whatever I was teaching, hoping to make of them better teachers, good teachers, better teachers for the education system in the country. I stayed with that work throughout the great deal of the 1980s, but then in the middle of the 1980s, we were confronted with HIV and AIDS in the country and in the world. And I saw very, very quickly that education was at risk from this because of the way it was going to take away the teachers, the pupils, the lecturers. I also saw that through education we could do something to address it, prepare the young people for this, and then also through education break down the stigma that was associated with this disease. And so I got more and more and more involved in this, and I was out of the country maybe two times every month in the, throughout the 90s. And I felt I'm not being fair to my students, I'm not there for them, and I'm not being fair to myself either. And so reluctantly, at the end of 2001, I retired from the university so that I would be free for the HIV and AIDS work internationally. And I kept that up until somebody bigger than me intervened. In 2011, I began to experience a lot of pains. I was in Honolulu, and I knew there was something wrong. I came back to Johannesburg. I had conferences there and that. And again, I was feeling pain and distress. I came to Lusaka, and the pains got worse. I went to doctors. I, I was careful of my health, and they said it was muscular. And I got treatment for muscular pains. And then a period of leave came up. I went to Ireland for leave. I left here on a Sunday. On the Monday, I went and stayed with my sister. On the Monday after arrival, I wasn't well. During the night, I had what later they told me was a very severe heart attack. And then on the Tuesday, I went to see a doctor and he sent me to a specialist. And the specialist wouldn't let me go home, straight into hospital. And after that, heart surgery for bypasses and for um, valve replacement, a couple of valves, a very long period in hospital, and frailty after that. So that's the history. But through all of that, peace all the time. I knew I was in God's good hands. And it didn't matter whether I was teaching at the university, whether I was whisking around the world in all sorts of places, or whether I was lying on a hospital bed face to face with death, as I was for two or three weeks. It didn't matter. God was there in the background all the time. And that was the Ignatian spirituality coming through all the time, supporting me through all that and helping me to keep smiling. One of the very big moments for me when I was very ill in intensive care was when one of the nurses came over to me and she said, it lifts my heart and makes my work easier to see you smiling in the condition you are in. But going right back to Chikuni, the students there, the schoolboys, naturally they had nicknames for us. And one of my nicknames was Smiler. <laughs> so that my personal disposition, which God gave me, and the society helped to develop in me, that helped me through everything. You know, how can you define um, what has been important for you? Um, what legacy are you leaving behind? What has really given you joy and fulfillment in the Society of Jesus in the work 
that you have done as work of the church? We say, we Jesuits, the Society of Jesus is a society of love. And I have experienced that love from my brethren and colleagues. Then special joy, people like yourself, to see Zambian Jesuits. I always wanted to see them. I heard something last week that filled me with joy. You know Stephen Wapa, uh, who was ordained to diaconate this year in Ivory Coast? His uncle was there for that ordination. His uncle, Julio Chiluba, had been a schoolboy of mine back in Canisius in the 1950s. And I always used to think in my mind, that's a fine young man. He could become a Jesuit. He didn't. But there's his nephew now, a Jesuit. And to see that, and the Ignatian, the greater glory of God, more, what more can we do? How many more Jesuits can we have within our province from Zambia and from Malawi and eventually from the whole of Southern Africa and across the whole wide world? How many more could we have taking up the challenges of Ignatius to help people to know and love God better, especially in the person of Jesus Christ, to help people to know and love the Mass and the Eucharist better and to make use of these how many more can we have? All of this brought me great happiness, great joy, and great inspiration in the society. A lot of boys pass through your, school, your hands in Chikoni. Um, just some of the significant names that you remember, can you, and what they have done uh, for this country. Uh, do you remember some of the boys? I, well, now you're asking a very old man whose memory is not the very best for, for some names like this. Well, I've mentioned Julio Chiluba already. Uh, we had at Canisius, uh, not when I was there as a regent, as a scholastic, but when I was there as a priest from 63 onwards, we had a number of them coming from Lusaka who were the... Um, became the cream of the country, some of them. One I remember, of course, undoubtedly, was Paul Lungu, Bishop Paul Lungu, who became a Jesuit to my delight and happiness, and afterwards became Bishop of Monze until his life was shortened by such a tragic road accident. Uh, there were other Jesuits there also, Felix Calebwe. I didn't know John Chula when I was there. He, he, came in an in-between period for me, but it, they were those. Sons of President Kaonda were at Canisius, uh, Panji and Waza, uh, and I knew them very well. Uh, at one time there, shortly after independence, I think we had the sons of about six or eight of the cabinet ministers. And we used to say, why don't they hold a cabinet meeting down here in Chikuni when they come to see their boys? Uh, uh, you've caught me unexpectedly there. I haven't thought up any names. Do you know Mark Chona and the Chonas? Uh, oh, the Chonas, of course. Yes, we did. Uh, I, I, Mark, Mark's brother, uh, Mainza, Mainza Chona. Um, he, he had been at the school before I was there, but the other ones we knew. Mark was a very great friend of my brother Bob. He had left the school before I went to it, but I knew them, of course, as persons. And the people around Chikuni, Ufanuka and all of these people around the Chikuni area, we knew them well also. Um, when you were teaching at the University of Zambia in the School of Education, there was something that was always said, that um, one could not graduate as a student in um, the School of Education if they had not been taught by Michael J. Kelly. You were like the 
um, <laughs> educate uh, the investor of them. That's so, news to me. I never heard that said. I never heard that said. Yeah, but it was said. Uh, the students felt that um, if they had not passed through your hands, they had not really uh, <laughs> qualified as teachers. Well, that's very kind of them to say that. And speaking of affirmation, as I did, isn't that a wonderful affirmation? And a, a very good tribute. And I'm very grateful to them for that. But I had my colleagues in the School of Education. I couldn't have got on without them and done the work without them. One of the things there was that in the beginning, um, there were no Zambians. There were no Zambians qualified. They hadn't the degrees. But they came in gradually, and we hardly noticed the change as we moved from a very largely expatriate teaching force to a Zambian teaching force within the School of Education. But uh, after being Deputy Vice Chancellor, when I went back into the School of Education, I was head of the Department of Education uh, for a number of years, I forget how many years, but I was that, and then there was the teaching and the research. And um, I was very happy to be able to leave with them a book that I prepared, uh, really a digest of the lectures that I gave to first-year students and the readings in support of those lectures, and I put it all together in a book, and it's very pleasant to know that that is still being used uh, very much at the university. Another thing that I was able to do at, when I was in the School of Education was I was asked by the Ministry of Education to be the chair of a team to work out an education policy for Zambia. This was in the mid-90s. And with the team appointed by the ministry, and I was the chair of it, we worked on a document which is still in use, educating our future. In fact, the printed versions of that document were the ones that I actually typed on my computer here in Luisha House. And that policy was recognized by the World Bank as being one of the best educational policies in a developing country. And it is, it was uh, adopted in 1996 and here we are now in the year 2019 and it is still the policy for the schools of Zambia. I think it needs to be changed and updated but it was very good that we were able to prepare something that has had such a significant impact on the total education system in Zambia. From what I remember living with you here at Luisha House, I could uh, describe your life as a triangle. There was the chapel, the university, the classroom, and the garden. How did these uh, three things fit together and shape your life? Well, the very first of them was the chapel, and it still is. Without what the chapel meant to me, my prayer in the morning, my mass, and prayer during the day and in the evening, I couldn't have survived. That's the whole meaning of my Jesuit life, of my Christian life. And so that was absolutely fundamental and continues to be because the other things have fallen away and are not possible, but that remains and that will remain forever. And I'm trying in this stage of my Jesuit life, you know that my official job is pray for the Society of Jesus and pray for the church. So these are, th this is of supreme importance to me, always was and always will be. The garden, it was my recreation. I'm not a terribly good one at the sitting around talking and people. I, I, yeah, I can sit and talk or be quiet with people, but I, I never played any sport in my life. I was never able for sport. 
I liked swimming, but I didn't have an opportunity for that here. But instead of sport, I went into the hobby of gardening, cultivating plants, later, especially here, cultivating vegetables. And I got great joy and satisfaction out of that. Seeing things grow, I suppose it was um, compensation for not seeing my own children grow. <laughs> I saw the plants grow and bearing fruit and bringing joy into the house, as well as economically being of assistance to the budget of the house with the vegetables and the fruit that came in from the garden, but also bringing in beauty and bringing in the freshness of God into everything in our lives. And then the third thing, of course, was the university, which absorbed my life so much. They have the university, and at the end, half or one third of that life, uh, that busy life from 75 to 2011, uh, the 10 or 12, 15 years and the HIV and AIDS work, that even though that was very challenging, and even though it was very daunting in a way to meet so many people who were likely to die young and the difficulty in confronting the disease, coping with it, managing it, and keeping one's uh, spirit alive in spite of all of this, uh, they were very wonderful years because I saw the goodness of people, how strong they were. People all over the world, no matter what the problems were, they were coming out on top. They were not giving in to this demon, this devil of a disease that had broken on the world. And now, thanks be to God, it's not conquered, but at least there are the drugs and universal treatment is much more on the cards than it was at the time I was dealing with it back in the late 90s, in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Um, I remember uh, the day we were burying uh, John Moore. Uh, there were about three or four of you elderly men looking into the grave. And I was just thinking, they are coming to the end of their lives and they are looking into the grave. What does this mean to them? And for you specifically, I know that you are a Zambian, you hold a Zambian passport, but you no longer want to renew the passport. And you say that your passport is going to heaven. Um, what does this mean for you? I hope I have a passport to up there. I don't need one for these countries. I'm never going to travel again. I think 2014 was the last time I was outside of Zambia. And I will, with the help of God, I will never leave Zambia again except to go to God. And God doesn't want a paper passport. He wants the passport of a good life, good deeds, friendship with him, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And that is my passport that I'm holding on to. The death of John Moore, looking into the grave. I look into the grave almost every day. I make the stations of the cross very frequently. Not every day, but very frequently. And when I come to the last station, the burial of Jesus, what comes into my mind is an open grave in Cassisi, and that's where I'm going to end up. And I'm yearning for that day, longing for it. There, there was a great saint back in the third century, second century, Saint Ignatius also, Saint Ignatius of Antioch. And he was brought to Rome to be executed. And on the way, he wrote a couple of letters. And in one of the letters, he said, I am yearning for death with all the passion of a lover. And I, listening to the murmur of the living waters of the voice of the Father saying, come to me. That's my motto. That's the way I feel. But it's qualified by something that is in our office in November for another saint, Saint 
the name has escaped me just now, uh, who said when he was coming to death in a monastery and the monk said, Father, don't leave us. We must have you with us. He said, Father, I ask, please take me, but if I am needed for the work, I will not refuse it. And that's the spirit that I like to have in myself. If, the, if I am needed for the work, for the mass here in the morning with the people coming, for looking after little things in the, here in the house, uh, for paying the workers, I'm the one in charge of all that kind of thing, for keeping the accounts of the house. If I'm needed for that work, well and good, I'll continue to do it, but I would love if you would take me. Well, let me tell you something. I, I mentioned to you that I had heart surgery. I had an extraordinary experience at that time. I was on the operating table for about eight hours. And I woke up just as it was finished. I could see the bright lights overhead. I could feel a rubber mask the breathing apparatus on my thing. I could feel the tightness on my chest where the surgeons had cut it open and sewn it up again. And then I heard a voice, my own voice, saying out loud to me, Kel, Kel is short for Kelly, Kel, this is it. This is death. And there was no fear. It was lovely. It was marvelous. And I thought, Wonderful. There was no sense of God, by the way. Just that. And then I saw a bright light. And in front of the light, I saw a thing rather like the thing around a lamp. And it was full of brightness. And I knew I had to get through to that light. But I could find no doorway. And I was disappointed. There is what I want to be. That's where I want to be, with that light. But I couldn't get there. And then I woke up, and the nurses were around me, tapping my face. It's all right. It's all over. But it wasn't over with my life, and I had to live on. But that closeness to death, that near-death experience, transformed me and made me want to get to that light. And please God, it won't be too long before I will do so. You recently celebrated 90 years uh, of life. And, um, you know, how can you define um, what has been important for you? Uh, what legacy are you leaving behind? I'd like him to remember me as a happy person. A happy person because of, of God. Because of relationship with God and with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And now let me go back. You said I was 92 weeks ago, which I was. I want to go back to the very day I was born. The day I was born was Pentecost Sunday. I was born on Pentecost Sunday with the Holy Ghost embracing me as it were. And not only was I born that day, but the birth attendant thought I was in danger of death. And she christened me, she baptized me on that very same day. So I was born to physical life on Pentecost Sunday. I was born to spiritual life on Pentecost Sunday. And I'm waiting for the Holy Ghost to call me back. Not waiting for Pentecost Sunday, but a happy, joyful person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that I will go to you and I will join them as soon as they think it is good for me to go, good for the world to go, and there's no further work for me to do here. Looking back at the Society of Jesus in Zambia and Malawi, what gives you hope um, for the society that you are leaving behind? Well, I think I've all mentioned, already mentioned one of the signs of hope, the increased number of locally born people within the society, Zambians and Malawians, in our current situation at the moment. 
and one of my hopes is that that number will continue to increase the Ignatian more. Give us more Jesuits. Please, God, give us more Jesuits. More holy men. Men in the first of our apostolic preferences, which was highlighted by Pope Francis as the most important one, bringing people to Christ. And we can only bring people to Christ if we are close to Christ ourselves. And so more of our men, that they are more and more closely identified with Christ. They are other Christs. They are holy men. And therefore, that they protect their periods of prayer and that they have a tremendous devotion to the Eucharist and to the Paschal mysteries of the life, death, resurrection and ascension of the Lord and the coming of the Spirit. So that is really what I would hope for. I would hope for also more obvious uh, commitment and dedication to the poor and work for the poor, for the poor and the marginalized. I think it's great that we have the parishes and that we're able to reach out to the poor through them. I think it's great that we have schools that will admit people who can't pay the fees. But I think we could be doing more for the poor, more on their behalf. And so I would hope that the society in the future will do more for our people, most of whom here are poor. More than half of them are very poor people and that we do more for them. Um, what have been some of the most difficult moments or painful moments in your life? Well, first of all, it would be the very painful experiences uh, of death and people li living, people leaving the, this life and therefore losing colleagues. Losing my own parents was very difficult. And what death means is separation. And therefore separation from people I love, my parents and my family, separation from fellow Jesuits and from other people in the country, in the community, that was always painful. Separation from other things, it was painful leaving Canisius and Chikuni. I found that painful. I found it painful leaving the university. I'm told we will be leaving this house later this year and going to some other house if it's built and ready. It will be painful leaving this. Leaving things is always painful. And things that we've loved, where we've been happy, which have supported us and encouraged us, that was painful. Within the society, I can't think of anything that I would regard as having been painful. I'm pained when I look back at Ireland for where I came from, that the vibrant Catholic faith is no longer so vigorous externally at any rate as I knew it when I was a child, when I was a young man there. The proliferation of other faiths or the abandonment of the faith and the practice of the faith by so many, but also painful to see that there's not enough, not more adjustment to the needs of such people. Painful to see the poverty of people, the poverty of the people here in Zambia, on the streets here, go down the country, the way they have to live and survive and make ends meet. I find that painful and very hurtful. Um, the apostolic preferences of the Society of Jesus, um, well, how do you look at them and how should Jesuits live out these apostolic preferences? Well, I think to live them, we must know them and we must have them before our minds all the time. And so the first one, that helping people to know Jesus Christ through the exercises and through our Jesuit spirituality, our Ignatian spirituality, 
deepening that within ourselves so that we can communicate it with others and the spirit of it with others. Walking with the youth, that's a especially important challenge for us here in Zambia where there are so many young people uh, where we have to respond to them through our schools here and in Malawi. We have to respond to them through our various associations and as individuals, doing whatever we can to affirm the youth, to bring them forward, to recognize that they are young people and therefore they have a different outlook and a different way of approaching things that we have, not to be hidebound ourselves in our own way, but to make them good. Walking with the marginalized, oh certainly, walking with the poor. I've said already I would like to see more emphasis on the poor, that we are a poor society for poor people, that we're able to help them, but not just the physically poor, the spiritually poor, the intellectually poor, the poor in health, the poor who, because of handicap of one kind or another, the poor who are not always with it mentally, all of these that we're reaching out to them and helping them. And finally, our mother, our mother earth, which I love and where I'm going to rest. She's going to take me in her arms very soon and I will be very happy there, but that we do what we can to protect this earth, to protect it, therefore, by being careful in our use of motor vehicles and, ca and cars, that we're not wasting the resources, that we're not polluting the air, that we're doing what we can by word, by example, to make this a better world for those who are coming along, not being caught up in consumerism or the capitalistic approach to everything, but seeing how together we can make this a viable world that we can hand on to the ones who are coming after it and make them love it and make them care for it. I think my life certainly is caught up in these things, even though I may not be able to do very much physically to promote them. The prayer that you made in the novitiate, take Lord and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will. How has this panned out uh, for your life at the moment? Well, it means take my activity. You have taken it, but you're welcome to it. Take all my mobility. I, with difficulty, I walk over to the gate here to unlock it in the morning, some mornings, not every morning. I, I don't go out unless I'm in a car. I can do very, very little. After I've said mass, and given a homily to the people here in the morning, I am absolutely whacked, and so I can't even talk at breakfast. Take everything, my liberty, I'm utterly dependent. If I want a bar of soap, I have to ask somebody, get me some soap. I can't go near a shop or anything like that. I can't go out to get post or anything. It's great having the email. I'm able to make contact with people from inside, from sedentary, but everything has gone. I said earlier that it was hard uh, saying goodbye to things. Well, I've had to say goodbye to all of that. My liberty, my memory. Oh, my memory is good on certain things, but not on many things. It has gone and it is going more and more even this morning, I remember, I was trying to think of the surname of one of my in-laws, and I couldn't think of the name. And then a half an hour later, it came back to me like that. So the memory is gone. My understanding, I think it's sharp enough still, but I'm old and therefore a little bit fossilized, 
and I'm set in my ways and the ways I've been doing things are the way I would like to see other people doing things and it can distress me at times if they're not doing things the way I would like them. And my whole will, whatever is wanted, take everything. Give me only your love and your grace. These, I'm rich enough. I'd say more than rich enough. I'm happy enough. And I ask for nothing more. You end a lot of money um, as a professor. And um, you supported uh, this house. And you had... Um, big dignified positions. How did you find yourself detached from all these things? Oh, well, I suppose the spirituality of the society, our vows of poverty, as well as chastity and obedience, that we've given over everything. Uh, we gave it to the, I gave it to the Lord in my first vows on the 8th of September 1948, and I renewed it with my final vows in February 1964. And we've given everything to the Lord and we prepared to live the common life that these things, they're important. It is very important to have enough for the daily running and the daily life. But if the things are not there, we can manage without them. We'll get on without them. The Lord is good and will provide. Now, if you have to say the final word, um, what is your final word to me? And uh, what's your final word uh, to the viewers? My final word is, may every Jesuit find fulfillment, happiness, and joy in their Jesuit lives. Peace, gratitude, and a desire to do what is possible for people, to make the same things available to people. That I would say to my fellow Jesuits. And for that, protect your prayer life, protect your community life, and protect your physical and emotional spiritual life. I want to see you as happy people, pleased that God is not somebody far away from you, but God is in all things. He's in the cooking pot on your stove. He's in the car that you're driving. He's in the people you meet. He's in everything you encounter, but particularly he's in your family and in your colleagues and in those who are close to you. Do what you can to be happy yourself and to make them happy, and then you are a person of God and you will be good in your life. God bless you and thank you. <laughs>